A reading from Philippians. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. In case you've been wondering or haven't noticed, I'm white. I'm a man. I'm a Christian. I was born into a Christian family in the Bible Belt of the United States of America. I've been accepted into the Wilshire Residency Program. And just like you, I am Wilshire. (laughs) Now, I don't know about you, but that makes me pretty privileged but it doesn't compare anything to Paul. You see, Paul had a list of credentials a mile long. He could have kept going. He just listed a few of them. Born into the tribe of Benjamin, circumcised on the eighth day, a Pharisee, persecutor of the church. Paul was privileged. He had a great list of credentials, but he knew that those credentials came with responsibility these credentials gave him more reason than anyone else to have confidence in the flesh. But the problem is, the word he uses for flesh, sarx, actually means human weakness. It refers to physical, external, or visible types of things as opposed to uh, spiritual, internal, and eternal types of things. Before Christ Before Paul met Christ on the road to Damascus, he was extremely privileged. He was already a leader in the Jewish community, and he was well on his way to being a high-ranking official. He had it all, fame, fortune, influence, power. He could have coasted through life without a worry in the world, but he couldn't. Because he met a man named Jesus who wanted to know him. You see, Paul lays out his resume not to brag or to make others feel guilty or even to speak poorly of his Jewish heritage. He laid out his resume to speak against the Judaizers, those folks who were requiring Gentiles to become Jews before becoming Christian. They were using their religious status 
to create barriers for non-Christians. And Paul's saying, you think you got something to live up to? Look at me. You have no reason to be confident in the flesh. And I do. But guess what? Neither one of them are enough. Because we need Christ. As we know from other letters, Paul has written specifically in Galatians when Paul writes about his conflict with Peter. Paul is adamant that one is in Christ not because of what we do, but only because of the love and the grace of God. You see, Paul was born with great privilege, but he also achieved great accomplishments. He wasn't just a Hebrew. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He wasn't just a Jew. He was a leader in the Jewish faith, and he had to work for those. You see, when we're born with privilege, it's a great blessing, but although it puts us in a better position to succeed, success doesn't just happen automatically. We still have to work hard and contribute to the success that we do have. We have to choose to put the advantage we've been given into practice, but also living in that tension and with that balance of not relying on ourselves too much, but also relying on Jesus. Because what we have is nothing, as Paul says, compared to knowing Christ. He even goes as far to say, my accomplishments, my greatness... That's just a bunch of rubbish. And unfortunately, we like to clean up what the Bible says because we don't want it to be too dirty. And evidently, second-year residents have to make some sort of reference to bodily functions (laughs) because the word rubbish actually is translated excrement or feces. That's what Paul compares his accomplishments to. Paul realized having privilege put him in a unique position. Even though Christ is the great equalizer of humanity, he's still in a position of influence and of power. And instead of using his privilege for his own benefit and comfort, he uses it to speak against those who are lording their religious privilege over those to establish their own status. Hmm. Sounds relatively familiar. How do we use our privilege? You may be sitting there and think, well, I don't feel like I'm very privileged. But in some way, shape, or form, we are all privileged. Maybe we're born with it. Maybe we're born into a great family, a great system. Maybe we were born white. Or maybe we're privileged just because we live in the United States of America and we have freedom to believe and live and speak how we want to. How do we use that privilege? Do we use the privilege that we have to get down with those who don't have it? Do we use our privilege to to build barriers? Or do we use it to welcome people, to open our arms, to say, you know, I may have some advantages in life, But that's not the main thing. The main thing, the non-essential, is knowing Christ. Paul could have easily acted selfishly. He could have stayed on his privileged pedestal and told all those other people that they just had to work hard and get to where he was. But Paul knew. He knew that he was in a different place than they were. Paul was born on third base. These folks were born in the on-deck circle with two strikes against them. And although both can make it home, Paul knew that the others needed some help as well as him. And that help comes from knowing Christ. So Paul chooses to go down, to speak up against these Judaizers so that the Gentiles and those who didn't know Christ could. Does this sound familiar at all to anybody? Familiar to the gospel message? Paul, a chapter earlier, had just laid out what it means to have the attitude of Christ. In chapter 2, 
Paul says, Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. This is what it means to be like Christ. And after meeting Christ, Paul realized that no amount of worldly privilege could compare with the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ as Lord. He understood the magnitude of what Christ did for humanity, and it was extremely real to him. And he wanted to do whatever he could so that anyone in the world could know this Christ. But what did Paul mean by knowing Christ? Some say that he's referring to some sort of Gnosticism, that you had to gain some sort of special knowledge about God in order to know him. But with Paul's Jewish background, this is very unlikely. More so, he has this Old Testament understanding of religion, and that's that knowing God goes beyond knowing the facts about God. To know God or Christ means to enter into relationship. And that's hard. It's tough. Because when we claim to know Christ, it's going to cost us something. We have to give something up when we enter into relationship with people or with God. And the thing that makes it so difficult is the thing that we have to give up is our very selves. Because if we don't, it continues to be a righteousness of our own rather than a righteousness because of our faith in Christ. An interesting fact about that phrase, faith in Christ, the way Paul writes it, it can also be translated because of Christ's faithfulness. So we have to determine when we read this, are we going to translate it as we get a righteousness based on our faith in Christ, or are we going to have righteousness based on Christ's faithfulness? The answer is yes. And maybe that's what Paul's getting at. You see, the word Paul uses here is the word pistis. It's a loaded word in the Greek, and it takes the English language up to four words to really accomplish and get at the meaning of this pistis word. Faith, faithfulness, belief, trust. To trust something is to rely on it. But to completely trust something is to admit that there is no need for anything else. All through the Gospels, Jesus calls people to leave what they're doing and follow him. We must deny ourselves, pick up our cross to follow Jesus. Jesus even told the rich young ruler, sell your stuff, give it to the poor, and follow me. Just as Jesus didn't consider equality with God to be something exploited, we shouldn't use or consider our privilege in life as something to be exploited. I read an article this week about the motivation of, behind why people vote for certain candidates. No matter what side you're on, unfortunately there's this temptation to call the other side stupid or how could anyone believe or vote for that guy because he wants us to do this? And how could anyone vote for that person because he or she wants us to do that? Well, this author tries to get behind that motivation. And she points out that people don't actually want to vote most of the time for who's going to increase the economy. They want to vote for the person who's going to allow them to keep their dignity this mentality of keeping our dignity is tied into the issue of racism. No one wants to occupy the last place in society, and as long as racism remains intact, poor white people, working class folks are guaranteed not to be the worst. If racism is ever done away with, then these people will then be the bottom rung. And in their eyes, that's shameful. Painful. And because it's so painful, whether they're racist or not, they vote for someone who might be 
because it keeps them from the bottom. She says, we must find ways for the working class to maintain its dignity. We must find a way for them to have jobs that are satisfying to them. We must find a way for them to contribute to culture. We must find a way for them to feel heard. Which, by the way, are the exact same goals we need to have for oppressed races. We all need the same thing, and until we find a way to give it to more people, we will fight each other for it. She's right. We all need the same thing. We need our dignity. But we don't need our dignity because of what we have accomplished ourselves. Even more so, we need to know Christ. We must let go of our economic privilege. We must let go of our racial and religious privilege, emptying ourselves out, taking the very nature of servants, trusting Christ's faithfulness and putting our faith in Christ, reminding ourselves that we are all equal in the eyes of God. And no matter the earthly privilege we may have, all people can experience this surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus who is our Lord? And this sounds great. <laughs> Knowing Christ. But one thing I've learned is that denying ourselves, trusting God, may be the toughest thing we ever do. It's hard. It's hard to let go. hard to trust and I think more than anything the thing that's hard to let go of is not what we have but it's control and no matter what anybody in this room says to me we're all control freaks when it comes to our own lives it's hard to put our faith in Christ because we don't know where Christ is going to lead. We don't know the future. We don't know who in our family and friends is going to be here tomorrow and who's not. Unfortunately, we don't always get to choose when we deny ourselves. One of those times is, is suffering. And we've talked a lot about that today with the Grief and Loss Center. Suffering is no respecter of persons and it can help us see our own humanity. It can help us see the humanity of others and more than anything else, it can help us see our need to know Christ. A few weeks ago, Ingrid Williams died in a car wreck. You may know of Ingrid. She's the wife of Oklahoma City Thunder assistant coach Monty Williams. She was hit head-on by a car who crossed over the center lane, and the driver, other driver was killed as well. A tragic event that had the sports world's attention. But it even went further than the sports world and grasped the attention of a country because of what Monty said in his eulogy about his wife. In it, he talked about his family's reliance upon God to make it through this difficult time. In his eulogy, he said this, We cannot serve the Lord if we don't have a heart of forgiveness. That family didn't wake up wanting to hurt my wife. We hold no ill will toward her family. We should be praying for her family as well. God will work this out. My wife is in heaven. God loves us. God is love. When we walk away from this place today, let's celebrate because my wife is where we all need to be. We didn't lose her because when you lose something, you can't find it. I know exactly where my wife is. The next day, I was listening to Dan Lebetard, who was a radio host for ESPN. And he was commenting on this clip that he had played that I just read to you. He said, I don't know what you believe in our audience, but even if you are someone who is stridently atheist, I don't know how you hear that honestly and don't want that in your life. I don't care what you believe. How could you not want whatever it is that brings this kind of strength 
in this kind of tranquility in a moment like that. Monty Williams is a privileged man. As a black man, he wasn't born with his privilege, but earned it, making his way into the NBA as a player and now a coach. He has an abundance of money, security, and great relationships. But his wife died. The thing that brought him the most joy, the thing that brought him the most pride, is gone. And when that happened, he didn't turn to his money. He didn't turn to his NBA accomplishments. He didn't turn to his players. Because he knows the one who can bring strength. He knows the one who can bring tranquility. In his moment of deepest longing and suffering, he realized that all he has accomplished, all of his privilege, is excrement compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus our Lord and being known by him. Amen.